Hi, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry, from engineering to operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Today we're going to be looking at a video by Nile Red on making uranium glass. I've never even seen or held uranium glass before. Worked with uranium a lot as far as a nuclear fuel, but never in this capacity. Let's check it out. Last year was the first time that I heard about uranium glass, and I thought that it was some marketing thing or something, but it's actually real. I mean, it's not glass made entirely out of uranium, but it is glass with uranium in it. Sure. This got me really interested in it, and I decided to buy some, and I got this cup of it off eBay. Pure uranium glass is normally yellow, but this one is green, and I think it's because they put some iron into Close it. In the dark. Regardless of that though, that's not really what makes uranium glass special, and it's what it looks like under a black light. Yeah. The uranium in it fluoresces, and it makes this really nice green color. The actual amount of uranium in it though is quite small, so the glass itself is only minorly radioactive. That's another thing. Okay, I can see where people getting more of the green glowy uranium from. Maybe it's like glass, it's all salts, and another video I reacted to by Styropyro. So, yeah, um, it's when you do these little, uh, these little fun things, which oddly enough have nothing to do with the nuclear industry. It's, it's kind of funny. General glassware in cups like this <laughs> just were super it. popular in the late 1800s and the early 1900s. However, during World War II, the government started confiscating all the uranium and diverting it to nuclear research. Yeah. This kind of killed the entire industry for uranium glass until the late 50s when some restrictions on uranium were lifted. I had no idea people did that much with uranium before World War II. That's, that's interesting. Other than like experiments, I didn't know there was a consumer goods industry associated with uranium. That's, that's interesting. A few companies started making it again, but at that point, the health effects of radiation were a lot more well known. And also, after the nuclear bombs, the public perception of uranium wasn't exactly great. Nowadays, there are... He says that, it's like, it wasn't great back then, but yeah, imagine it's, it's even crazier now, as in you have people thinking that the uh, water vapor coming out of cooling towers of a nuclear plant is radioactive. It's... He's right, but it's even crazier now. Apparently still a few companies that make it, but I wasn't able to find any of it for sale. As far as I know, if you want to get some uranium glass, you really can only buy the old stuff. I found this all really interesting, and I've been wanting to work with uranium for a while, so I decided to make some uranium glass. Cool. My original plan was to buy some uranium ore, and then refine it, and <laughs> use that purified uranium to put into some glass. However, a lot of equipment Cody over at Cody's lab that the government doesn't really like it when you show how to refine uranium on the internet. Uh, Instead, okay. I had to start with an already purified source, and I was able to find some depleted uranium. This means that it's missing the isotope to do things like generate nuclear power or make nuclear weapons. <laughs> I love this pros cons list. So pros, easier to get. Cons, no nuclear energy. I agree, that's a con. Can't make bonds. That, that, that's a con. <laughs> <laughs> I love this. I love this. But depleted uranium is actually used in weapons, not, not nuclear weapons, but the uh, A-10 Warthog, it's uh, ammunition that it uses to split tanks in half involves depleted uranium. Armor on an Abrams tank involves depleted uranium. So you can't make nuclear weapons, but I guess you could make nuclear comma weapons. <laughs> <laughs> However, it's still good for making glass. Uranyl nitrate is the nitrate salt of uranium, and when it's pure, it can form these nice yellow crystals. Whoa, that's cool. Besides just kind of looking pretty though, it seems relatively mundane, and that's something that I've always found interesting about radiation. Yeah, uranium nitrate, um, again, never will work with it, mainly uranium oxide, which is just a black little pellet, and fresh uranium, which is just a silvery metal. So it's interesting that the uranium used in nuclear is actually more uh, mundane than uh, what this guy's using. As this uranyl nitrate just sits it's there, it's shooting off thousands of extremely small particles, but they're way alpha too particles. small to see or to feel. So an alpha particle is a helium nucleus. So yeah, you, you ain't going to see that. 
there's no way to naturally perceive that it's there, and this was one of the biggest reasons why it took so long to discover radiation. To know that it's there, it has to be detected using some sort of instrument or setup, and over the years, many Those different methods cool. have been yeah. developed. Nowadays, one of the <laughs> easiest ways is to just use a Geiger counter, but before starting this project, yeah. I didn't have one. However, when working with something radioactive like uranium, it's pretty much absolutely necessary. So I looked around online, and I ended up getting this one off Amazon, which wasn't very expensive, but it was supposed to be decent. Yeah, Geiger counters are very inexpensive, probably one of the least expensive and very most user-friendly um, radiation counters detectors to use. I turned it on and I let it stabilize for a minute, and I saw that the natural background radiation was about 15 CPM. CPM stands for counts per minute, and it's a reading of how many radioactive particles it detects over a minute. Specifically, how many ionizations uh, it detects. Note that stuff like sunlight, which is technically a form of radiation, isn't going to be detected, but strictly ionization, so natural ionizing radiation is what he's looking at. Radiation exists everywhere in the environment, and you're always being bombarded by it naturally, and this reading of 15 CPM is actually quite low. Now, it's a small it was time to test it with the uranium, so I just put it next to it. There was clearly an effect, and this Geiger counter was going to be more than usable for this project, but it unfortunately wasn't going to be super accurate. This was So part of it is alpha particles have a very short range, um, and even that little casing of that little vial he has there, that's going to stop some of those alpha particles, so this thing's actually reading pretty low. Because most of the radiation that's let off by uranium is in the form of something called alpha particles, and this counter is not even able to detect them. It's only able to pick up the beta and the gamma rays that it's letting off, which are significantly less than the alpha. Despite this though, it's still going to be really useful, because I don't actually need a super accurate reading, I just have to know whether or not it's there. That is the exact purpose of a... Geiger or Geiger Mueller counter. It's just to tell you if radiation is there. You mainly we mainly use it to scan for uh, contamination, not discriminate between what type of radiation you have. You can see why. So for Geiger Mueller detectors, the voltage is significantly high, and the device is simple enough that it's not going to distinguish between what type of of radiation there are, whether it's alphas, betas, gammas, and regardless of what energy level they are, it's all going to do the same thing. One bit of incident radiation is going to ionize the entire chamber. Now, for different types of uh, counters, like a um, proportional counter, uh, like a gas-filled ionization chamber or something, it can discriminate between um, what type of radiation you have. You can even graph it to see where the peaks are and how much of it's alpha, how much of it's beta, if you have a mixed source and you're trying to figure out what it is. But that's not, he doesn't need that for what he's doing. You're just trying to find out what's radioactive and what's not. Now, before getting started, I just wanted to try one other thing. Urinal nitrate was supposed to be fluorescent under UV, so I put some on a dish, turned off the lights, mm. and shot it with my black light. And well, it was definitely fluorescent. This made me think cool. that maybe to make the uranium glass, I could just directly throw the urinal nitrate into some molten glass. However, when I looked it up, it didn't seem like that was the case. So the main hazard associated with ha handling uranium itself is internal um, dose. So don't eat it, don't inhale it. Um, it'd probably be good for him to be to have a fume hood nearby just in case. I don't know if he's wearing a face mask or not, but you can you can touch it and be fine. You can put it; it won't it won't penetrate the skin. And like you said, betas and gammas are trace. They're not even much above background radiation at this point. I mean, I could barely find anything about making uranium glass in general. But out of all the info that I did find it always mentioned using something called sodium diurinate. Hmm. Based on this, and considering the fact that I'd never, never heard made of uranium glass before, I figured that it was probably best for me to use that as well. 
Now, though, this meant that the project was going to be a bit more fun because they'd have to do some uranium chemistry to convert the uranyl nitrate into the sodium diurinate. To get this started, I had to add the uranyl nitrate to a beaker, and normally, I would have just quickly waited out on some paper and then dumped it in. However, this time, I was working with a uranium compound, so I had to be a lot more careful. This is because the dust that it could let off is not only radioactive, it's also toxic, and it can lead to heavy metal poisoning. That's true. So, to be as safe as possible, yeah. I carefully weighed everything directly in the beaker, and in total, I used about 15 grams. That's one instance, and this is, was actually happened during the, uh, some of the Chernobyl cleanup, was when they used lead, as lead is stable, not radioactive, to extinguish some of the fires up mixed with sand and boron and a bunch of and a bunch of other materials. I talk a little bit more about that in my review of the uh, Chernobyl series. But the lead itself can melt and and even boil when it gets that hot, when it gets that hot and it can become an airborne hazard and basically that thing could that thing turned out to be just as deadly as the radiation from from the accident just because of all the uh, because of all the lead poisoning and most uh, most radionuclides eventually of, of the heavy stuff like uranium eventually decay to lead over a very very long period of time but just because it decays to lead doesn't mean it's um, doesn't have the potential to be hazardous when it's lead then on top of this, I dropped in a magnetic stir bar and I poured in some water, which should have been enough to dissolve all of the urinal nitrate. I turned on the stirring and I waited for it all to disappear, but unfortunately, it ended up staying a little bit cloudy. Wow, okay. I tried adding some more water just in case there wasn't enough, but it didn't seem to do very much. This was unfortunate because it now meant that I had to clean things up a bit and I didn't really want to have to work with a solution of uranium. Yeah. Thankfully, however, cleaning it up wasn't exactly going to be super difficult, and I just had to do a quick filtration. I did this by passing it through some cotton and some sea light, which is kind of like super fine sand. The stuff that initially passes through tends to still be a bit cloudy, so I let it run for a bit, and then I swapped it out for a new beaker and put the other stuff through it again. After this, it was perfectly nice and clear, but there was still a bunch of uranium solution all over the funnel and in the cotton and sea light, so I washed it out with a bit of water. When all the water had eventually passed through, I took away the funnel, and the solution was pretty much good to go. Now... So, on the subject of nuclear waste, if this, um... We've never done these sort of this sort of work in a um, in a nuclear power plant, but if we did anything with uranium in it, we're going to be conservative and treat that as nuclear waste. This would be low level waste and would just involve would just involve cleaning. But people talk about nuclear waste and how difficult it is to dispose. Over, well over ninety ninety five percent even is easy to clean. In some bits, you need to wait for it to decay away. Not the, not the case with uranium. The, uh, like the little bits on his funnel, if he can't get it off, would technically be considered nuclear waste, which is, which is interesting. Convert this to the sodium diurinate, I had to react it with something called sodium hydroxide. This is also known as lye, yeah. and it's often sold as drain cleaner, and that's where I get all mine from. For this reaction, it also all had to be dissolved into water, but the exact concentration of it didn't really matter. I figured that something around 30% by weight would probably be good, so I measured out about 70 mils of water and dumped in roughly 30 grams. Sodium hydroxide is, I mean, at the nuclear plant, we use it uh, just for, for pH control. It's, it's caustic. No, not really any different than pH control in any big industrial place that has a lot of pipes that you just gotta, you have to eventually worry about corrosion, um, pH, conductivity, things of that nature. And this is one, just one of the chemicals that you use to uh, control the uh, water chemistry. It's just water-related stuff. It all dissolves relatively easily into water, but it also generates a lot of heat. So mm. in the end, the solution is usually pretty hot. However, I wanted it to be closer to room temperature or maybe just slightly warm. So I put it in the fridge to cool it down. 
When I felt that it was good, I took it out of the fridge and I started slowly adding it to the urinal nitrate. Almost immediately, it started forming these weird, solid, kind of donut looking things, and this was all sodium diurinate. The reason this happened was because, unlike the urinal nitrate and the sodium hydroxide, the sodium diurinate is practically insoluble in water, so the moment that it formed, it separated out. Cool. What I had to do now was basically just keep yeah. adding the sodium like hydroxide the until it stopped making the diurinate. At this point, it was still pretty simple because the solution was nice and clear and it was really obvious to see. However, I eventually started stirring it and the whole thing got a bit murky, <laughs> so I couldn't just rely on looking at it. Instead, to know when it was done, I had to keep testing the pH. I did this just using some cheap pH papers and I kept adding the hydroxide until it turned blue, which told me that the pH was about 10. Mm. After this, I just let Coffee. it sit there for a bit to make sure that it all fully reacted <laughs> and then I filtered it off. I just did this by pouring it through a simple coffee filter and when most of the water had passed through, I washed it a few times with distilled water. I then let it sit there until all that water passed through as well and now, I had some so relatively crazy. clean like sodium diurinate. It was all still wet and goopy though and I'd have to dry it out, but it was going to take forever just sitting here in the strainer. With other chemicals, I'd usually just set up a fan That's on the cool side glass. to help speed things up, but that would probably end up shooting a small amount of dust into the air, and I didn't really feel comfortable doing that with uranium. No. <laughs> so instead, you don't. I carefully took out the coffee filter and I put it in a bowl and I pulled a vacuum on it. Under yes. a vacuum, water vaporizes a lot more, and this makes it dry a lot faster. In a closed space though, like in this vacuum chamber, there's nowhere for the water vapor to go. So to fix this problem, no risk I of inhaling a bunch stuff. of drying salt at the bottom, which would constantly pick up the water vapor. I pulled it out about five hours later, and it was mostly dry. I purposely didn't let it dry completely, because I wanted to avoid as much dust as I could. By keeping it slightly wet and a bit pasty, I was able to pretty safely scrape it all off without making any death clouds. Also, <laughs> death besides clouds. the safety issue, I was worried that if I let it dry completely, that it would just stick to the paper and become impossible to separate. I was able to get almost all of it and put it into a small bottle, but there was still some stuck to the paper. Getting this last bit looks, was a lot just, sloppier than cheese. I wanted it to be, but I didn't really have any other alternative. On, that I just did my best to scrape it all off, and then everything <laughs> that even remotely came into contact with the uranium was put into a special waste container. Everything that I took off was transferred to the same small bottle, and I did it as carefully as I could, but it was still a bit messy. There was a bit of uranium that managed to get on the outside of the bottle, and I of course had to clean that up. And I did this by just wiping it down a few times with some wet paper towel. Now, with all the uranium safely in the bottle, and none of it on the outside to poison me when I touched it, I was ready to finish drying it. To do this, I put it into the same vacuum chamber that I used earlier, and I pulled a really strong vacuum on it. I wanted it to be as absolutely dry as possible, so I left it in there for 3 or 4 days. So wow. I came back to it a few days later, days, repressurized okay. the chamber and took it out, and well, it worked, it was really dry. Yeah. When it's dry Crystals. like this though, it has a tendency to give off dust and yeah. powder, which is obviously really horrible to breathe in. This was why I only dried it completely in the final container that I was storing it in, so I wouldn't have to move it around or handle it. That's smart. I went ahead and weighed what I had here, and it came out to be 9 grams, which was about what I expected. Just for fun, I decided to test it with the Geiger counter, and you can see that the glass was able to block most of the yep. radiation. The reading that it had was only barely above the normal background level, but that totally changed when I moved it over the top. Yes. Oh yeah. The reason this happened was that most of the radiation that was being let off here was in the form of alpha and beta particles, and they just couldn't make it through the glass. Beta would be stopped by the glass. Um, something about this with the thickness of your credit card could probably stop a beta. Could stop um, normal beta particles unless you threw them through a particle accelerator or something. As I mentioned before, though, this counter isn't able to pick up alpha particles in general. So what I was seeing here was probably mostly from beta particles. Now, one other thing yep. that I wanted to try was to shoot UV on it, and I was surprised that it didn't fluoresce. 
I mean, maybe it was fluorescing and it was just super weak, but as far as I could tell, it was pretty dead. I thought huh. this was really interesting because logically, you'd assume that if you wanted to make glass fluoresce, you'd put something fluorescent in it. However, I guess that just isn't the case, and glass chemistry is a bit more complicated than I thought. But anyway, now that I had the sodium diurinate, I could start trying to make the glass. However, I'd never made glass before, so I kind of had no idea how to do it. I looked around online, and one of the best things that I found Whoa. was a video by Ben, who runs the channel Applied Science. He gave a lot of good details and tips, and almost everything that I'll be doing here is That's based so on stuff cool. that I learned from him. I also got a few tips from Andy, who runs the channel called How to Make Everything. When it comes to making glass, it's not super straightforward, and there are a lot of different ingredients that can be used. For beginners though, Ben just recommended to use a mixture of three different things. I've never silica, made glass. sodium carbonate, and boric acid. So that's what I went with, and all these ingredients were really easy to get, and I just ordered them all from Amazon. Now boric acid is interesting, because we actually use that in a, the pressurized water reactor that I worked at. Think of it as a liquid version of control rods, because it contains boron, which has a high absorption rate of neutrons higher than that of uranium, so it stops the, uh, the uh, fission reaction. So, um, another way you can borate, which is adding borate acid to the reactor in order to lower reactor power, or you can dilute it, just add more pure water to the uh, to the reactor and that will raise reactor power that's actually how in a pressurized water reactor you we say maintain temperature um colloquially in operations but temperature and power still kind of um, still follow but because you're really um what's, what happens is you're using up more of the fuel and then you dilute to compensate like, for instance, at the beginning of life, at the pressurized water reactor I worked at, the boric acid concentration is about 1,400 parts per million. And then at the end of life, right before you need to shut down and refuel because you used up all the fuel, the uh, boric acid concentration is less than 30 parts per million. It's another way to uh, control reactor power in addition to control rods. And one of the reasons why you have multiple methods of doing so is redundancy. So, you know, in case you have one issue or, or one of your systems doesn't work, you have another way to do it. And two, about uh, power peaking. They change the uh, power distribution in different parts of the core, the boric acid versus the control rods. So it's nice to have both for just a more uniformly distributed power level within a nuclear reactor. I then got a jar, added 60 grams of each, and shook it up to mix it a bit. Like this, it would probably work to make glass, but in my opinion, the powder was still too chunky. So to fix this, I put it all into a blender, and I ran it for a few <laughs> minutes. This apparently worked pretty well, and after this, it was a super fine powder, and it kind of looked like flour. This was definitely way better than before, and I hoped that it would give me a better quality glass. Before adding any uranium to it though, it was a good idea to test it to make sure that it worked. I had also never probably made glass before, and it was probably a good idea to get at least some experience making it before trying it with uranium in it. The general like idea guy's behind approach. making glass was very simple, and all I had to do was melt this powder. So, I added a bunch of it to this dish that I had, which was normally used to melt things like gold, and I put it into a small furnace. By the fact that it was glowing orange, it was obviously pretty hot, <laughs> and I had set it to around 1100 C. I wasn't That's completely hot. sure that this would be hot enough to melt it, but when I checked on it a few minutes later, it looked like it was working. And now, because there was more space in the dish, I decided to add some more glass. At this high temperature, the sodium carbonate was mostly just melting. To give you a sense, 1100C, you're getting into nuclear fuel temperatures. Normal nuclear fuel temperature. But the boric acid was breaking down into boron trioxide and water vapor. This caused it to bubble a bit, and you can see this if you look really closely. The main purpose of these chemicals, though, was that they both have much lower melting points than silica, and they help lower the overall melting point of the mixture. 
Pure silica only starts melting around 1700 C, but at that point, it's still way too thick to work with, and you have to get it well over 2000. Get One thing is during the uh, Manhattan Project um, at the Trinity um, atomic detonation, they, since you're in a desert, all that silica in the sand, a lot of that turned into glass because of the extremely high temperatures of the atomic bomb. The temperature this high is just very hard in general, and because of this, additives are almost always included to lower the melting glass. point. In my case, because I used boron trioxide, the final result would be some sort of borosilicate glass. In general, borosilicate glass is a Gross. lot less sensitive to big changes in temperature, and I hoped that this would help prevent the glass from cracking as it cooled down. But anyway, I let it sit like this for about 30 minutes, and I waited for it to completely liquefy. When it eventually looked like it was about ready, I used a blowtorch to preheat a graphite square. Then, I carefully got the dish from the furnace, and I poured out all the glass. I let it cool over the next 15 or 20 minutes, and it looked pretty decent. It looked like just a regular piece of glass, and I was actually pretty proud of it. I really thought that it would crack, but apparently it didn't, and I was still a bit skeptical of it. So I left it overnight to see if anything would change, and by the next day, it was still totally fine. That's cool as far looking. as I could tell, this glass mixture worked pretty well, and the process seemed to be relatively simple. After doing it just once, I was definitely by no means a pro at making glass, but I felt that I was ready to get the uranium involved. <laughs> to do this, I just had to add some uranium to the glass mix, but it was still a bit too chunky. If I added it like this, it wouldn't mix in properly, and it would make some really uneven glass. Don't inhale the powder. So far, I had really done my best to avoid working with any powdered uranium, but unfortunately, I didn't really have a choice here. Mm. I just did my best to grind it very carefully, and to try to make as little dust as possible. Orange. When I was done, I put it all back into the bottle, and everything that came into contact with the uranium was put into my waste container. Now, to actually add it to the glass mix, the amount of uranium that I needed was super small. However, I didn't know exactly how much I had to add, because from what I found online, some recipes use as low as 0.1% uranium. I like uranium, those, like, yeah, uranium recipes. <laughs> this concentration was all done by weight, and I decided to go with a moderate 0.25%. Yeah. I figured that this way, if the final glass didn't glow well, I could just add some more. At 0.25%, though, barely any was needed, and for what I had here, I only had to add 0.4 grams. To mix it in, I shook it around for several minutes, and when I was done, it looked the same as it was before the uranium. Hmm. As far as I could tell, it was still really white, and I guess there just wasn't enough of it to noticeably change the color. The dish from before was already in the furnace, and I started loading it up with some spoonfuls. I waited for this all to melt, and then I added some just more. Recipes, spoons, involving uranium. Uh, <laughs> also, as a never had that safety, experience. this was all being done in my fume hood, just in case it let off any uranium fumes. In there reality, yes. there probably wasn't Good job. much or Good any of it, practice. but it was obviously something that I had to be very careful with. When I checked on it and it looked ready, I preheated that graphite block again. Then I took out the dish, and I poured out what was hopefully uranium glass. While it was still red hot, it Whoa. was hard to tell, but as it cooled, it was definitely colored this time. That's it so also cool. shrank a bit, and when I felt that it was solid enough to move, I picked it up and put it on some glass insulation. With a white background, the color was a lot easier to see, yeah. and it was a really nice and bright yellow. That's this so was cool. exactly what I was hoping it would look like, and so far, things seemed to be going pretty well. Now the next thing to do was to test and see if it was fluorescent. So, I got out my UV lamp, turned it on, and, I mean, it was kind of working. The glass was it. definitely a bit green, but it wasn't very impressive to say the least. My first assumption from this is it? was that 0.25% just wasn't enough uranium. However, then I thought, maybe it was just still too hot, mm. and I had to wait for it to cool down. So, I decided to have some patience and to test it again a few minutes later. This time, it still wasn't okay. amazing, but it was for sure better than before. 
I then let it cool completely down to room temperature before testing again, and this time, it worked really yes. well. The point There's that green glowy uranium that, that a lot of people think enough. of when they think of and uranium. I guess I wasn't going to have to add any extra. There was still some glass left in the dish, so I poured it out as well, and I made another little flat glass thing. This one also worked really well once it was at room temperature. That is so and cool. And it glowed nicely under UV. It's I'm really appreciating him showing us all the steps to make this uranium glass and this stereotypical view of uranium. And it's, there's quite a bit involved taking him, I lost count at the time, but it's, probably, it's taken him over a week at this point. Because I know he said that one, that one step involving putting it, drawing a vacuum and leaving it under there for several days. So yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty involved. After making these, it was getting late. Not as involved so as enriching uranium, but still. And come back in the morning. Unfortunately, though, when I checked on the glass, one of them had spontaneously oh, broke. broken. These pieces were a lot bigger than that first test run, and it was looking like this might cause some problems. One of them was still okay, though, and I thought that maybe only one of them breaking was just some bad luck. <laughs> then, almost as though it somehow knew what I was thinking, it responded by splitting in half right when it was sitting in front of me. This was completely random, so oh, I unfortunately no. didn't get it on camera, mm. but this made it clear to me that there was an issue. This was happening because I had cooled down the glass quickly and unevenly, and it had caused a lot of internal stress. What I thought might work to fix this was to just insulate the glass and have it cool down really slowly. <laughs> the the final me. result would still be under high stress, but I was hoping that it would lower it enough just so that it would stop spontaneously falling apart. For this one, I also decided to try making it a lot bigger, and I loaded up way more glass. I then poured it all out, and the moment that it looked solid enough, I put it between some insulation. After that, I moved it to one of my benches to cool, and it initially seemed to be working well. However, a few hours later, I heard the sound of breaking glass, and this was what I came back to. A lot of stress <laughs> had clearly built up, and it was wow. apparently enough to shoot some of it a couple inches. The pieces that survived didn't seem to be too fragile, at least when I was hitting them. However, shocking them with heat probably would have caused them to pop. Breaks when you walk away. I decided to try breaking glass. a piece of it with pliers, and it was surprisingly difficult. The moment that it did break, though, it just exploded from all that internal stress. You got your safety glasses I on, buddy. I thought this buddy. was really cool, but what I wasn't a fan of was all the powdered uranium glass dust that was flying everywhere. Yeah, ooh, the dust, yep. After doing this, I realized my only real option was to anneal it. To do this, I'd have to hold the glass at around 450C for several hours. At this hours. temperature, the glass is solid, but it's still liquid enough that its atoms are able to move around. This happens really slowly, which is why it takes several hours, but it lets them move to new positions and reduce the overall internal stress. This is the proper way to do things, and it's what I ideally would have done before, but I was trying to avoid it because I only had one furnace. This mm. makes it much more difficult and slow to do things, but I figured I would try it out. I still really wanted to make a big disc of it, so I melted the rest of the powder that I had, and I poured out another one. Then, as it was cooling, I quickly changed the furnace temperature to 450C, and I put it in. To anneal this, huh. it would take at least several hours, and I was planning to leave it overnight. In the meantime, I collected all the broken glass that I had, and because now I didn't have a furnace, I melted it with a torch. <laughs> now what I wanted to try here was to do some glass blowing with it, but I had no idea what I was doing, and it was a total failure. <laughs> Instead, I just made it several happens. beads that I thought I were like small enough that I could get though. away I really without do. annealing them. However, at the last minute, I got the genius idea to anneal them just in case. I knew it was a bad idea to open the furnace, but I did it anyway, and it was, well, a bad idea. I tried to put it in quickly, but where the beaker touched the disc, it started forming oh, a no. crack. I then tried to move it around to get a better look at it, and cracks formed everywhere that I touched. Uh, I actually so thought that this was pretty cool, but now I was worried that it would just end up exploding again. So I took it out, and I blasted it with a torch to heat it up again, and to melt the surface. 
This way, I was hoping that even if there were cracks, if I sealed the top, it could prevent it from falling apart. After this, I put it back into the furnace, and I let everything anneal overnight. The next day, I was worried that I'd open it up and just see a disaster. I was initially a bit disappointed that the big piece got so cracked, but I actually ended up liking it. <laughs> I think having it like this made it a bit more interesting. That's so cool. I think the small beads that I made also turned out really well, and none of them were cracked or falling apart. Nice. The question that I had now, though, Make uranium how marbles. How radioactive were these pieces of glass? Considering the amount of uranium that I put into it, it was definitely quite low, but I still wanted to test it. The Geiger counter that I had, though, wasn't the best for this, and I decided to invest in a better one. This one really? is much more sensitive and has a bigger detection area. Wow, And it okay. can also detect alpha particles. To test it out, I did... Interesting. That's... Okay. He... Those are more expensive. <laughs> wow. The biggest piece, and with the uranium concentration of only 0.25%, I assumed that the reading would be really low. However, it was more than what I got with the pure urinal nitrate because it was now actually seeing the alpha particles. The detector yes, also had the detector a totally window. different shape and a much larger surface yes. area, which let it pick up many more particles. As a unit, CPM only shows the strict number of particles that it detects, and it doesn't differentiate between things like alpha, beta, or gamma. Yep. This is important like though, when trying to judge how dangerous a radioactive source is because they aren't all equal. For this reason, it's sometimes better to go with a different unit like Sieverts, which will take this into account. In my That's good. Not this was this is a pretty high end uh, Geiger counter. Most of them that do the conversion aren't pure pure Geiger counter. It, it, it would have to uh, discriminate between the two, take the energy into account as well, and do a little and do a little calculation. A pure this is beyond the level of a a pure Geiger counter. Sieverts per hour, this gave a reading of about 5.5. Uh, it's actually more than I figured. Uh, five microsieverts per hour is comparable to that of a dental x-ray or eating about 50 bananas. And according to this, which I got from the Canadian Nuclear Association, okay. it means that if you held your cheek against it, it would be like getting a dental x-ray every two hours. Now for one of the yeah. beads, I got that it was only about 1.3 microsieverts per hour and this was just because it was a lot smaller. In either case though, at this level of radiation, this glass is generally safe to have around and to occasionally handle. However, it would be a very bad idea to fill your pockets with them or something and to carry it around all the time. It might be okay to occasionally wear it as a necklace or something for a short period of time, but I don't think it's the greatest idea. Nah. The philosophy of um, health physics, radiation protection, try to keep radiation dose as low as reasonably achievable. And I can totally understand the reason for not wanting to have to have it on your purse. That was really cool. Um, I've, like I said, never done anything with uranium glass. It was cool to see that green glow in something realistic. <laughs> and again, they it was actually more radioactive than I thought it was, which is... Just fascinating that you can you can make something like that. Still, I knew it was still going to be in a relatively safe level. You certainly don't want to eat it, and you certainly don't want to have or or even eat out of it. Like make it into a glass cup and drink out of it. Now, nah, I I wouldn't recommend doing something like that either. But it was really cool to see someone go through all the processes and see how laborious it is to do something like that. It's very very fascinating. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.